Okay, so just want to welcome everybody in person, online, and so uh, this is part two of um, the message I started last Sunday, and we're, we're again in indwelling life, and this is uh, session 17, part two. I mean, it's like the never-ending indwelling life, but I think, I think it's really helping some people to, to understand what it means to live by the indwelling life of Christ. Um, this is part two of the message. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly review a couple things, and then I'm going to jump into the new, new material here. And let's, let's start by reading Romans chapter 6. And I mentioned this last Sunday, that Romans chapter 6 is the heart of the gospel. The book of Romans is the, is the heart of the gospel. The, the book of Romans is a, an epistle that uh, Paul wrote that to me, if you want to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, the book of Romans explains the gospel of Jesus Christ like no other book of the Bible. It is an incredible book. I, it's one of my favorite books in the entire Bible. But in Romans chapter 6, we come to the heart of the gospel in Romans 6. And I mentioned this last Sunday, but I will, we'll just read it again because it's so good. Starting in verse 1, as Paul was saying, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? And scholars who comment on the book of Romans, a lot of them say that Paul was being accused by others of teaching uh, what, basically that it's, you, because of grace, because of justification by faith, it's okay for you to live however you want to live. And Paul is addressing that accusation that's coming against him because of his teaching on grace and his teaching on justification that's in Romans chapter 5. Paul is addressing that and saying, you know, shall we continue in sin so that grace may increase? He's addressing his accusers. In verse 2, Paul says, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? And now, now Paul's bringing in a, a new concept to the Romans and to really probably most of the church. Most of the church does not realize that when Jesus Christ died, they died in him. And so here, in verse 3, Paul says, Or do you not know, and I want to just pause just for one second and highlight this word know, because Paul in Romans chapter 6 uses the word know or knowing four times, three times it's something Paul wants us to know. And it's not an intellectual knowing Paul's after. Paul's not after an intellectual knowing that we would know facts or theology or information. Paul is wanting the church to know by revelation what he's talking about. Paul received these, this teaching in Romans 6 by revelation, and Paul is wanting those who are hearing his message in, in the church of Rome to receive it by revelation. The same revelation Paul had when he received this is meant to be the revelation that the Romans had, the, revel the revelation we have. And so Paul is really wanting us to, to know this. And he says, do you not know, do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death? This is a past tense work. And I talked about this last Sunday, that... When, when, you were, when, you became, when you became a born-again believer, when the Spirit of God regenerated your spirit and gave you a new spirit and put the indwelling Holy Spirit inside of you and joined your spirit to His spirit, and what we talked about last Sunday, you were baptized at that time into the body of Jesus Christ. And by God's doing, you are in Jesus Christ when you were born again. And then when you were water baptized as a symbol of your spiritual union with Jesus Christ, Paul is saying is when the water that symbolized baptism of what the Spirit did when you were born again to, to baptize you into the body of Jesus Christ, when you were baptized into his body, Paul is saying this, when that happened, you were baptized into his death. See, you were included in the death of Jesus Christ. That's what I talked about last Sunday. You were included in the death of Jesus Christ. When he died 2,000 years ago and you were born again and you were united to Jesus Christ by, on the condition of faith and your spirit was regenerated and your spirit was joined to the Holy Spirit and you were baptized into Christ's body, 
God considers you that you also died in Jesus Christ when he died. And so Paul's getting at this logic. Shall we continue in sin after we're being born again? Shall we continue sinning after we have been saved? And Paul's like, absolutely not. Do you not know that when Jesus Christ died on the cross and you were united to him by faith, that you also died in him? Verse 4, therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ, listen to this, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, what Paul is doing here is he's saying, here's the purpose I'm getting at in teaching you about your inclusion in the death of Jesus Christ. This is what I'm getting at, is so you to might walk in newness of life. Knowing you were crucified with him, knowing that you died in him, Paul is saying that is a key to living by his life. When Paul says that we too might walk in newness of life, Paul is saying basically that you might live by his indwelling life, what we've been teaching on. And so Paul is saying is that you need to know these things so that you might walk in newness of life. Verse 5. For if, when I, I, just, I encourage you, by the way, to read Romans chapter 6 and read it over and read it over and read it over, prayerfully read it over. I'm telling you, it's, one of the, it's such a deep chapter that ask the Lord for revelation of this. But Paul says in verse 5, For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, that word united is a very rich Greek word that basically means born together with. That you are born, if you have been born together with Christ, that when the Spirit of God implanted himself into your human spirit, and that word can actually mean grafted, the Spirit of God was grafted to your human spirit. The Spirit of God baptized you into the body of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul's getting at. And you're growing up with him. Paul says that if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, we weren't united with him in his actual death because only Jesus died, but it's in the likeness of his death. We are identified with Christ in his death. And so I mentioned four different analogies in the sermon last Sunday that, that, you know, I mentioned it's like a passenger in an airplane. Whatever, wherever that plane's going, you're going because you're in it. I mentioned the SIM card and a phone. The SIM card's going wherever the phone is. I mentioned about the marriage, that when you get married, whatever issues your spouse have are now become your issues. Also, your, their joy. So it's not just negative. Um, I also mentioned when Hawaii became the 50th state of the, of the United States, Hawaii could then say, we celebrate the 4th of July um, and we celebrate our independence because Hawaii was united with America. Before Hawaii became the 50th state, Hawaii could not say, we celebrate July 4th for our, our day of independence. But after they became united and became part of the United States, they could say, their history is my history. All that to say, Paul is saying you have become identified in the death of Jesus Christ. Now, look what he says in verse 6. Knowing, again, it's knowing. Catch that. Do, do you not know? And he says again, knowing. This is a revelation that Paul's trying to get at. If you don't have a revelation of this, ask the Lord for a revelation of this. It's very, very important. I don't really know if you can progress very far in the Lord without knowing this very Christianity 101, the heart of the gospel. It's the heart of the gospel. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, it actually means might be rendered powerless the body of sin is not done away with like it goes away. The body of sin, this flesh, is rendered powerless so that the flesh and the desires of the flesh don't have power over you because now you have a greater power in you. And that's the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. He now dwells 
in you. Your spirit literally touches the Holy Spirit at all times if you're born again. You're never far from God. You're never disconnected from God. It doesn't matter how you feel. The Spirit of God, if you're born again, literally touches your human spirit at all times. You are vitally connected by the, by the Spirit of God to, to Christ in heaven. And Paul is saying that you've got to know that when Jesus died, your old self was crucified with him. In order that the body of sin might be rendered powerless so that we would no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died, from, died is freed or justified from sin. Now, there's, there's a lot more here. I'm going to skip down here to uh, verse, verse uh, 11. Paul says, and, and I think it's hinging off the fact that you know. Paul says, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God in Jesus Christ. So that, that's Romans chapter 6. I encourage you to read it. It's a, it's a deep, deep, deep uh, passage of Scripture. And so what we talked about last Sunday is we said there is a difference between your legal position in Christ and your living condition because Christ is in you. And so I just want to re review that real quick. We have slides here to show. Is your legal position, we, we showed this last Sunday. We're going to just go over it again just so we get this in our heart. Your legal position is what Christ finished for you on the cross. Your living condition is what the Spirit has finished in your spirit and is now finishing in your heart, soul, and body. Your legal position hinges on identification. That's what we just read about in Romans chapter 6, that you were included in the death of Jesus Christ. You were identified with Christ in the likeness of his death, but your living condition depends upon experience. How much of that do you experience by the indwelling Holy Spirit making it real in your life? Your legal position is constituted, imputed, and reckoned. Those are big legal terms, so that basically means and we talked about this last Sunday in the new covenant that Jesus Christ is our covenant representative and so that whatever is true of Christ is imputed to you because he is your representative. Therefore, when he died, you died. Therefore, when he was crucified, you were crucified. Therefore, when he was resurrected, you were resurrected in him. When, you, when he ascended, you ascended in him. When he was enthroned, you were enthroned in him. That's what that means. But your living condition is life-based. How much of that... Do you actually have in your life by indwelling life? See, it's not enough just to have a, a declaration, you're the righteousness of God in him. How much righteousness has been formed in you so that you yourself are walking righteously by the Spirit of God? Does this make sense? Your living condition is life-based, actualized, and incarnated. God wants to incarnate by the Spirit of God the life of Jesus in your human flesh. God wants to form Christ in you. God wants to form Jesus Christ in you. God wants to form the image of his Son in you, in your heart, in your soul, in your body. Your legal position is an accomplished fact. Your living condition is by faith. Your living condition is determined by faith in this accomplished fact. And so everything I'm talking about today is about faith. Is if you don't believe it, you'll never have the reality of it in your, in your inwardly in you. And as I survey the, the church around the world, I believe that, that so much of the church does not have the experience of the cross of Jesus Christ in them. And what I mean by that is, they don't have the internal working of the cross in them. They, their their self-life is not being put to death experientially by the Spirit of God. And we've got to have that working of the cross to become the new wineskins God wants us to be. Okay, so then we talked about last Sunday. Your legal position in Christ is the result of three realities. You are in Christ by God's doing. I believe that's 1 Corinthians 1.30. Is, is Paul said, you are in Christ by God's doing. And the second thing we looked at is Jesus Christ is your representative in the new covenant. And then number three, you were baptized into the body of Jesus Christ at new birth. 
Okay, so that's the review for last Sunday. This is, this is where we're going now, is your legal position is not enough. Just, it, it is not enough for you to be the righteousness of God in him. He's also wanting you to be actually righteous, to be holy, to be pure. It's not enough to just stand up and quote uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, I'm the righteousness of God in him while you're still living a selfish, carnal life. God wants to put, make the reality of your righteous in him true in your life so that you are living righteously. It's not enough for you to say, I have been crucified with Christ and included in his death 2,000 years ago. He wants the work of the cross experienced in you so that the working of death by the Spirit of God to the deeds of the flesh is working in you so that you are your selfish nature, your selfish carnal nature that wants to do what you want to do, when you want to do it, and how you want it done has become united by experience in the work of the cross. So that by experience, Jesus Christ has crucified you with him by experience. So now the life you live is by the Spirit of Jesus. See, it's not enough for you to just say, I have been resurrected with Jesus Christ, and to wallow around in your miserable life, moping and groping around, and just be like, oh, life's so bad, negative, blah, blah, blah. God wants you to live by his life, by his resurrection life. You are, God wants you to consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. See, it's not enough for you just to say, I have ascended with Christ into heavenly places. God wants you to live in, in everyday life in the authority and the power that ascension with Christ means. It's not enough just to say, I am seated with Christ in heavenly places. God wants you to live victorious over the world, the flesh, and the devil as an overcomer. See, it's not enough just to say, I am more than a conqueror in him. God wants you to have true victory in your life. And so what I'm getting at is it's not enough just to, to quote your legal position in Christ, but not have any experience of it in your life. The gap between our legal position, our living condition, must be closed by the Spirit of God. So that what Jesus purchased is real in you. It's not just real because you're in him, but it's real because his life is released in you and through you. See, let's, let's look at some examples of legal position and living condition real quick. So you can see what I'm talking about just from scripture. Let's look at Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. It's a, it's a very familiar passage of scripture for many of us. But Paul, he, he's talking and he's talking about how he lives and he says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Jesus Christ. What he's talking about, in, I believe, in this passage is he's expressing the truth of his legal position. When Jesus was crucified, I was included in his death. When Jesus was crucified, I was crucified in him. Now, that was the basis for him to be able to say, the life I live, I no longer live. Uh, I'm just kind of just reading this out of my head. The life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, is that Christ in me is the one living. But the basis for that was him to know his inclusion in the death of Jesus Christ. Now, look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. This is... Many years later, I think it might be, I'm just off the top of my head, 20, 30 years later, towards the end of Paul's life, Paul says in Philippians 3, verse 10 and through 11, he says that I may know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection. What is he asking for? He's asking for experience. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to be conformed to his death. How many of you want that? Probably not, not many of us. Like, ugh, I don't really, I want it, but I don't want it. I want the resurrection. I don't want to have to die, really. I, I mean, you know, die, the self-die. 
so that he could attain, attain to, the, to the resurrection from the dead. So Paul is saying here in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified, that's my legal position, but I want the experience of the cross working in me, conformity to his death, so that I might experience a greater resurrection, both a greater resurrection in this life and a greater resurrection in the age to come, is what Paul is getting at. Now, now let's look at another example here of your legal position, your living condition. Colossians uh, 3, verse 3 Colossians 3, verse 3. Paul said, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That is your legal position. That's your legal position. You have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's your legal position. But now notice this, and I'm going to read from the New King James Version in verse 5. Now Paul says, put to death your members. Well, I thought you just said we have died, but now you want me to put to death? How can I put to death what's already dead? Well, see, Paul's hitting at, in verse 3, your legal position. In verse 5, he's talking about your living condition. In verse 3, he's talking about how you identify with Christ. In verse 5, he's talking about what you experience by the Spirit of God. You see that? Paul is basically saying, let the experience... Let the Spirit make it real in your experience of what Jesus purchased on the cross. Put to death. This is, listen to what Paul said. Put to death your members. He's talking about the, the flesh. And if you read in Romans chapter 8, Paul said that if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. When Paul says, put to death your members, he doesn't just mean you. He means you in union with the Holy Spirit. See, this is, a, this is a synergistic work. It is the Holy Spirit in you working together by the power of God inwardly to put to death your members that want to sin against God. What does he say? Put to death your members which are on earth. Fornication. That means fornication is sexual, uh, sexual sin outside of the context of a marriage relationship. It would include any kind of sexual activity outside of a marriage relationship between one man and one woman. Uncleanness. Anything that would be related to anything unclean, you know, defiling. Evil passion, evil desire. Coveting, you know, wanting what other people have. Wanting and desire what other people have. And Paul says coveting is actually idolatry. Well, what is, what is Paul practically telling us to do? Put to death, because you were included in the historic death of Jesus Christ, put to death the members of your body by the indwelling Holy Spirit, those things in you that want to sin against God. And, and we could, I mean, he could list out all the deeds of the flesh, and he would probably know all of us, anger, coveting, jealousy, judgment, whatever it would be, Paul is saying that you must be united in the experience of the death of Jesus Christ that is, that is more than just your position. I'm telling you, the church of Jesus Christ, by and large in the Western world, and I would say probably by and large around the world, has, has forsaken the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Where is the message of the cross? Not just what Jesus finished for us, but what is he finishing in us? What, are we coming into an experiential union with the cross of Jesus Christ where we are, are experiencing death to self, death to selfish ambition, death to the sins of the flesh, death to the deeds of the flesh, so that we might live by an entirely new life? We've got to, if we're going to go anywhere as a, as, and I'm just not talking about us as a, a local church, but as the church, if we're going to go anywhere in God and where we're meant to go, we've got to come back to the central message of the cross of Jesus Christ. May the cross work death in us. Putting to death selfishness, selfish desire, selfish ambition. Jealousy, judgment, criticism, lust. 
I mean, I mean, just whatever, anger, whatever it would be, putting that to death so that we could live, be raised into an entirely new way of living. All who are doing that are the sons of God. They are the mature sons of God. They are the ones that creation is groaning for, longing for. Paul talked about that in Romans chapter 8. All creation is groaning and longing for the revealing of the sons of God. The sons of God who put to death the deeds of their flesh and they're living by the Spirit of God, creation's longing for that now, yes, but ultimately in the age to come at the second coming of Jesus Christ. May God bring many sons to glory who are experiencing the work of the cross in them in a deeper way. You have died is your legal position. Put to death is your living condition. I have been crucified with Christ is your legal position. Your living condition is I want to be conformed to his death that I might also experience his resurrection. I'm telling you the life of Jesus Christ is far better than your life in the flesh. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control is far better than drunkenness, sexual immorality, jealousy, envy, coveting, you know, whatever, uh, anger, drunkenness, whatever. It's far better, far more satisfying. See, so much of the Christian journey is becoming who you already are in Christ. You are righteous in Christ, live righteously. You have died in Christ, crucify your flesh. You, ha you have been resurrected in Christ, live by his resurrection life. You have ascended with Christ, therefore live in authority and power. You have overcome, therefore live an overcoming life over the world, the flesh, and the devil. You are seated with Christ, therefore walk in victory. God wants to close that gap between our living, con our living condition and our legal position. You know, you just think about it in a car. When a car gets out of alignment, what begins to happen? Whether you, let's say you're, you're driving and all of a sudden you hit a, a curb or you hit a pothole or something and your wheels get out of alignment. I sound like I know what I'm talking about with cars. I don't. It's, I mean, I really, I don't even know anything. I'm, yeah, Angie knows far more than me. I basically just take it to the place and get the old change and do whatever they tell me. I'm terrible at cars. Yeah, yeah, you do that. <clears throat> Yeah, that's more of just busy, but yeah. So Larry, don't judge me, but you're, you're, actually I should have Larry come share this part, but you hit a curve and you hit a pothole, your car gets out of alignment, and then what happens is you're, you start veering to the right or you start veering to the left, right? I looked it on the internet, that's what the internet told me. <laughs> Chat GPT was telling me this is what happens, so it better be true. But it's like that in our lives if there's a gap between our legal position and our living condition, if there's this gap between our living condition and our legal position, we begin to veer off to the right. We begin to veer off to the left, and God wants to bring us into spiritual alignment. God wants to close that gap between our legal position and our living condition so that what Jesus purchased on the cross becomes real, becomes true, becomes experience in you. And in me, obviously, too. And so if we're going to do that, we've got to learn to take possession of the land, so to speak. I think about, you know, here's an analogy to help you understand what I'm talking about. Is, you know, God told the, the children of Israel, he said in Deuteronomy 11, you don't have to turn there, but Deuteronomy 11, 24, he says, Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. I'm giving you this land from, you know, basically from Iraq into Egypt. I'm giving you this land. So any, any place the foot, your foot touches, I'm giving to you. And so basically God said, this is your land. This is your promised land. But that did not mean that God just sat back and, or, or the Israelites just sat back and just waited for God passively to do it. No, they had to go to war. They had to go to war. They had to fight. They had to wage war. They had to contend. They had to wrestle. They had to fight real enemies to possess what God had promised them. See, in Christ, you are crucified. In Christ, you are dead. In Christ, you are resurrected. In Christ, you have ascended. In Christ, you're an overcomer. In Christ, you have sat down with him. 
That is who you are in Christ. That's your promised land. But you've got to fight. You've got to contend. You've got to wage war for the reality of that to be real in your own life. If you just sit back and say, well, you know, quote, I am the righteousness of God in him, and then do whatever you want to do, you're never going to take possession of your land. You've got to fight, and as you go out and, and work out your salvation with fear and trembling, God begins to fight for you, and he begins to give you the victory. Let me skip ahead here. If we are going to have this kind of victory I'm talking about, it begins by faith. It begins by faith. And so a lot of times, I've mentioned this throughout the teaching, is a lot of times faith is looking into the future. I need a breakthrough in my healing. I need a breakthrough in my relationships. I need a breakthrough in my finances. I need a breakthrough in my work. Whatever it be, it's looking to the future, and faith is trusting God and his promises. Obviously, that's vital. That's vital. What I'm talking about today is not faith in God's promises, but faith in God's facts. Faith in what has already been accomplished faith in what has already been done. See, we, we get spiritual amnesia so much and we forget that our spirit has been raised from the dead. We forget that our spirit is one with the living God. That is amazing. <clears throat> we forget that and faith is how we make it real in our experience. I, I, can't, I can't stress enough the importance of living by faith. See, forward-looking faith... Forward-looking faith says God can or God will. Re uh, faith in God's facts, what has been accomplished, says God has already done it. When you're battling the flesh, whatever it would be, whatever you're battling in the flesh, whatever you're battling, whatever sin, whatever selfishness, whatever it is you're battling in the flesh, it could be a million different things, whatever is your, you're battling, the truth is, is you have died with Jesus Christ. When faith rises up and says, I can't live in sin any longer because I've already died to sin, that's faith in what has already been accomplished. That's faith in God's facts. Faith in God's facts, it doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if you feel it or not. It doesn't matter if you know it or not. If you're in Jesus Christ, you have been crucified with him. You have been uh, buried with him. You have been raised from the dead. So when I was born again in the fourth grade, I had no idea until, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago that any of this happened when I was in the fourth grade, but it did. It was, it was the truth of what happened, but I did not know that, but it didn't change the truth. But when my faith began to be awakened and I put my faith in God's facts of what God said happened, when God said happened, when I was in the fourth grade, I began to experience more of the cross, more of the life, more of the victory that Christ purchased because my faith began to make a pathway for the Spirit of God to make it real. See, the Holy Spirit works by faith. If we don't, this, I mean, this is really, really simple, but if we don't believe, the Holy Spirit doesn't move. If we believe, the Holy Spirit moves. And as you get older, as I'm getting older, um, as we all are getting older, it's easier to become cynical and jaded and not childlike because you, not to be as naive because you've been there and done it and you've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, and it's easy to lose the wonder of that childlike faith. That's why Jesus said, Unless you are converted to become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Is that we've got to become like children in our faith. We've got to have that simple reality and understanding that what happened when Jesus died is we died with him. And then, then through faith, believe it. And then the spirit of God begins to make it real and begins to move when you believe by faith. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 in the Darby translation. This is not a good translation of the Bible, but I do want to just read this one verse as an illustration of this. I don't recommend this translation at all. 
Um, and I, in fact, this verse is not really even the correct translation of Hebrews 11.1, 1, but I think it makes a point that aligns with other biblical verses. Uh, uh, Hebrews 11.1 1 says that now faith is the substantiating of things hoped for, the things of things of con the conviction of things not seen. My point here is that faith substantiates. Faith makes it real. Now it's not something we in our in ourselves are creating. Faith makes it real because it allows the Holy Spirit to begin to move. It begins the the whole. See, if we're going to put to death the deeds of the flesh, then we are going to have to have the Holy Spirit moving and empowering us to put to death the deeds of the flesh. We can't put to death the deeds of the flesh without a greater power. And it takes faith, it takes faith to believe that what Jesus accomplished 2,000 years ago, it takes faith for us to believe that, to substantiate it, to take possession of the land step by step, little by little, so that we can walk in the victory that Jesus purchased for us on the cross. See, we, we've got to have faith. Faith, is, faith in God's facts. Faith in what Jesus accomplished is vital. And there's a couple slides here I want to show here. Is, I'm going to read this here. Is faith does not make the finished work of the cross real... For it has been real for over 2,000 years. Faith makes the finished work of the cross real in your life. Faith actualizes what Jesus did for you on the cross in your personal experience. Faith makes you who you are in Christ, or faith makes who you are in Christ who you become by divine life. It's faith. 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 Well, how do you get faith? How do you grow in faith? How do, you, how do you get faith activated so that what is true about your legal position becomes true about your living condition? Well, the first thing we're going to look at is by revelation. I mentioned this earlier, but knowing by revelation. This is not an intellectual knowing. This is not an academic knowing. It's not information you're knowing. It's not just you can quote the Bible verses, but it's revelation. It's the very revelation Paul had when he wrote the book of Romans is meant to be our revelation. See, when we read Romans 6, the, the revelation that Paul received directly from Jesus Christ, we are to receive directly from Paul, and it's become revelation that we know the, the very, and having the very emotions of that experience Paul had is becoming our emotions, and we know that's real. This, this is real. I, was, I, was, I died when he died. Knowing by revelation. We looked at that. Do you not know that when you were baptized into the body of Jesus Christ, you were baptized into his death? Do you not know that? Do you know that? Do you really know that? Do I really know that? It takes a revelation of that. It takes a revelation. Ask the Lord for a revelation of that. See, you've got to have a personal revelation. You've got to have a personal revelation. In Romans 6.6, 6, Paul said, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. See, Paul wants you to know that. Your old self was crucified with him, included into the death of Jesus Christ. See, your sins were not just imputed to Christ on the cross, but you were imputed to Christ on the cross. Jesus did not just absorb your sins, he absorbed you. He did not just bear your sins, he bore you on the cross with him. You died when he died. That's what Paul's getting at. And now Paul is saying, knowing this, knowing this, knowing this. And when you know that by revelation, not by head knowledge, not by information, not by facts, not by quoting Bible verses, but when you know that, 
that then allows the Holy Spirit, when, you, when your faith is united to, when your faith is awakened, when your faith is activated, that then allows the Holy Spirit to make it real so the, the flesh experiences the death of Jesus Christ so the life of Jesus Christ might live and flow out of you. Some people just are, they, they fight tooth and nail. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I'm not talking about physical death, but I don't want to die to myself. I don't want to die to myself. I'm telling you, the life of God expressed through you in the fruits of the Holy Spirit is way better than your boring, fleshly, carnal life. I mean, I've been there and done it. It's not what it's built up to be. It's death and misery. See, when God says you have been crucified, it is a settled issue. God says it. God's done it. It doesn't matter if you feel it or don't feel it. It, it does not matter. It's true. And so what we need to do is for that, our faith to align with that. And that's where we get to the second thing. How do we activate faith is we reckon. Paul said in Romans 6.11 in the New King James, he said, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, Paul, is, let me read it again. Reckon yourself. How many of you, how many of you reckon, learned, have learned how to reckon? Okay, it's not like the old southern guy that, I reckon that these old people. That's not what Paul's talking about, that kind of reckoning. I reckon that these old people or these young people, they just get on their phones and just text each other and don't even know how to have a conversation. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, reckon yourselves to be. In other words, Paul's saying, you died in Christ, you were resurrected in Christ, reckon, therefore, that you're dead to sin and alive to God. What does it mean to reckon? It basically, if you look up the Greek word, it basically means to meditate. It may, basically means to think deeply upon. What, what Paul is really getting at here is, is don't just skim over this, but I, Paul's exhorting us, go into deep contemplation and meditation and prayer, not just for like a minute or two minutes, but five minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and not just one or two times a year, maybe one or two times a week of your inclusion in the death of Jesus Christ and reckoning, I am dead to sin. I'm dead to sin. I'm alive to God. My, 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 I, my sins have been taken on the cross. I am alive to God. Reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to God. See, knowing leads to reckoning. Knowing by revelation leads to reckoning by by meditating, by thinking deeply upon, by prayerfully considering what really happened when, Jesus, when I was born again and how God included me in the death of Jesus. See, we, see we've got a problem in the church of, of forgetfulness. Is we forget who we are. And I, I shared an example uh, many sessions ago about Simba and Lion King. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget what God has done. Don't forget who is in you. See, as you begin to meditate on these truths, as you begin to meditate on these truths, I have died when Christ died. I am dead to sin and alive to God. As you begin to meditate on these truths, you begin to remember who you are. You can begin to remember who, is it, who it is and who is in you, Christ in you. You realize, you realize what he has done. Uh, but as we do this, we're going we're gonna to come across a warfare, and I don't just mean necessarily from the devil, but it could be, but also from the mind that says, this is all just weird. This is like weird. I, I'm, like, I'm trying to say over and over and over something, and you know, has, you know, nothing's really happened. It's just a meaningless religious creed. I'm the same person I've always been. See, your mind is the battlefield. That's why you've got to double down and keep pressing in and keep, keep meditating to say, it doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter what I've experienced. It doesn't matter what my opinion is. God says my flesh is crucified. Therefore, my flesh is crucified. It's an established fact that I need to believe. 
keep speaking, keep, keep writing, keep singing this until the, the truth and faith is awakened and you know by revelation this is true. See, when we talk about uh, reckoning, when we talk about meditation, we're not reckoning something that is not true. It's not like going, okay, I need a million dollars in my retirement account, so I'm going to reckon a million dollars in my bank account. Okay, so I'm going to reckon <clears throat> I have a million dollars in my retirement account, I have a million dollars in my retirement account when I only have 10000 No matter how much you confess that or reckon that to be true, your bank account won't change one cent. <laughs> when we talk about reckoning, we're not talking about something that's not true, okay? This is not some New Age Middle East, you know, mid, uh, not Middle East, but some New Age meditation thing where we're reckoning something so we can make it true. No, this is true. God's word says us about you. This is true. This is not... We're trying to just say it over and over to brainwash our minds, though our, our minds need some good washing for sure. This is about reckoning what is true. When we talk, when God says to reckon yourselves dead to sin but alive to God, what Paul's saying is it's true, come into agreement with the truth by faith. It's true. You're not trying to reckon something that's not true, you're reckoning what is indeed true. Remember, all that we talked about meditation, confession, singing, writing, uh, praying, saying it out loud, all that, just immersing yourself in I have been included in the historic death of Jesus Christ. When he died, I died. I, I've been identified in the likeness of his death. I've been identified in his resurrection. Therefore, I have died to sin and I'm alive to God. I'm dead to sin and alive to God. I'm dead to sin and alive to God. Lord, would you now make that real in my experience? Again, the secret power of meditation. We go back to renewing the mind. This builds upon renewing the mind. Reckon yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. Do it often. I encourage you to do this often. I have been crucified with Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. If you can tap into this, 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 this way of life of faith being activated, faith being stirred up, so that what's true about you in Christ becomes true about you in experience, in experience, through faith as the Spirit moves to make it real in your experience. See, don't quit. Do it over and over and over. Do it as a way of life you will begin to experience change. This has practical value. This is, will make you a better father and mother. This will make you a better uh, dad. This will make you, or I guess father and mother, husband, I meant, meant to say, husband and wife. This will make you a better person. This will make you a better employee. This will make you a better minister. This will make you a better at everything is when you learn to live by this life of God in you, knowing that you died when Christ died and allowing the Spirit of God in partnership with you to put to death the deeds of the body so you will live. Meditation is the key to activating faith. It's the law of the mind Paul talked about that goes hand in hand with the law of faith. The law of the mind, renewing the mind, meditation, confession, getting it deep into your heart until, until your, your heart believes what God's word says is true, then you will begin to see life change. Then you will begin to live in that newness of life Paul was, asked, was exhorting us to live. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I, I just want to thank you for the glory of what, who we are in Christ and the glory of our faith uniting with that to make it real an experience. Father, I just pray right now for us, Lord, that the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit would come. And Lord, you would, you would make who we are in Christ 
who we are and experience. That there would not be a gap between our legal position and our living condition, but you would close that gap, Lord, we pray, so that, Lord, who we are in Christ would be who we are by Christ in us. Lord, would you rise up within us and would you put to death self-life? Would you rise up within us, Lord, and would you put to death sin? Would you rise up within us and put to death carnality and all that it means to live by your life, Lord, that we might have the indwelling life of God flowing outwardly like a mighty rushing river, we pray. Lord, we ask you to bring us into that union, Lord, that there would not be a gap, that we would have alignment, spiritual alignment, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. We'll end the...